That was El Capeo by Antonio Pereira. From this flamboyant Paso Doble, we move to a sultry begin called Harlem Nocturne by Earl Hagen. <laughs> The next piece is the first movement from a full movement work by Pierre Max Dubois. Dubois studied at the Paris Conservatoire, and this piece is typical of the florid virtuosic style which is characteristic of the French classical repertoire. A large proportion of the classical saxophone quartet repertoire is made up of this sort of music. The piece is called simply Quartet for Saxophones. <laughs> Thank you. 
the saxophone is now being accepted as a classical instrument, and so more composers are writing works for the saxophone quartet. The next piece was written last year, especially for us, by the British composer John Gardner. We particularly enjoy playing this work because each part is equally demanding. For instance, the second movement begins with a beautiful alto saxophone solo, accompanied by tenor and baritone. It's interesting to hear the sonorities of these instruments without the soprano. The work is in three movements and is called Quartet for Saxes. <laughs>
Finally, we'd like to play some music by George Gershwin, who in his day helped to bridge the gap between classical music and jazz. His songs are particularly suited to the saxophone, and we'd like to play three of them. Nice work if you can get it, I can't get started, and I've got rhythm.
This Saturday, part two of our Indian serial, Shri Kant. When Anada's husband dies, she's left alone. Let's look at the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. I tell you, do not go back there. Do you still think I make my plans in a far-fetched way, leave anything to chance? Up. What's that? Up. Now, wait a minute, Erasmus. Up. Saturday night on BBC One. At 6.15, Mean Tricks spell trouble for Superman. Your mind is clear. Your will is gone. A brand new bag of tricks from Master Magician Paul Daniels at 7. And some heavenly levitation. At 7.50, Midnight Temptation for the Amazing Shrinking Woman. All right, Chase. <laughs> Works. Could you be tempted at 8.20? Terry Wogan and a moral dilemma in Do the Right Thing. Doing the wrong thing at 9. Subterranean Horror starring Kevin Bacon. Tremors. And with Premier League soccer action in Match of the Day at 10.50, it's a night of surprises for Saturday on BBC One. Let's see if the weather's up to that. Tonight, despite the continuing wind, will be cold. Showers will be least prevalent in the eastern Grampians and eastern England. Snow will fall on hills above 200 metres. If you want the rest of it, here it comes on Saturday. Much of the United Kingdom will have another cold day with strong and gusty west to northwest winds. Further blustery showers will develop and some will be heavy with a risk of hail and thunder. The showers may be prolonged for a while during the day and over high ground they'll fall as sleet or snow. However, most places will have some sunshine between the showers, especially over eastern areas during the morning. The outlook for Sunday and Monday remaining very unsettled. Sunday will soon become wet and windy everywhere. Monday is going to be colder and brighter again with squally showers. Typical bank holiday weekend, really. There we are. It's uh, four minutes to two. Time for BBC One to close down. Thanks very much for watching. We'll be back in the... Uh, well,
a few hours here on BBC One. But don't forget, BBC Radio carries on right through the night. You've got a choice from 1FM, Radio 2, and, of course, Radio 5 Live. Here at BBC One, though, all that remains for me, Andy Taylor, is to wish you, on behalf of all the team, a very good night. Good night. Before anyone says anything else, I'd just like to make a little speech. Go To coincide with British Science Week, BBC Two presents The Exploratory, a series of four interactive debates on the past and future of science. Science is gee whiz, it's tricks, it's something separate from everyday life. It's controversial. Perhaps it's little green men, another civilization. It's contentious. We don't know what we don't know. It's conspiratorial. There is a hidden agenda. It's the exploratory, starting Monday, 11.15, on BBC Two. Is this what you want? Well, it's what Tessa would expect. Everything I've done, I've done for us. Does it have to be like this? Apparently. Love Hurts, the final chapter, just a moment on BBC One. watching BBC Two. Now, fasten your seatbelts and prepare for an unusual journey as we present the sequel to Nicholas Barker's cult series, Signs of the Times. Seventy motorists share their thoughts and dreams from behind the wheel as they travel from A to B. Victoria's changed a lot since she learned to drive. She always stayed in the house, watched the TV upstairs, video, or read, or wrote to pen friends. She had a lot of pen friends in those days. She never went out.
she got the car. That was that it. Was her, life, her life changed literally overnight. I used to look out my bedroom window and gaze longingly at this beautiful shiny red XR2 and I used to think, you know, like in Wayne's World, oh, one day she will be mine. And when I got to hear that he was selling it, I just went over and made him an offer. I coveted that car for over a year. I envied him for driving a car like that. I don't like debt, and when Victoria took the loan out of the car, I was very worried that it might be too much for her. It's almost as large as our mortgage. Also, I thought it might encourage her to drive a lot more and use more petrol, and more petrol means more emissions, etc. You know, and people do drive around too much, and it's not good. My parents don't really like the idea of me going out in my car so much. They'd rather I saved the money from the petrol and paid off my debts. I just wish she'd shut up. I really love fluffy dice. They're very tacky, but I like them. That's why I like them, because they're so tacky. I've got a, an Alpine sticker on my back windscreen. I haven't got an Alpine stereo, but it like looks good. Eh? <laughs> and I've got this colour-coded car wax that I use on my car to make it really gleam. Because I think my XR2 has got to shine. It gets you out the house. You know, like when I'm at work, all day I spend looking forward to it. The, the hours can't pass quick enough for me. As soon as I get in from work, I have my dinner, have a bath, maybe watch some TV, do my makeup and my hair, then I'm out. I hit the streets. I cruise about the town, the main street, park up in the car park. It's just part of my life and I love it. I wouldn't swap it for anything. My parents think I'm stupid. They can't see the fascination with going out in your car every night, but I love it. I don't think I could live without it at the moment. <laughs> They're under control in the house. I don't mean control under your thumb. I just mean you know where they are. And these days, an awful lot of things can happen. Maybe they always could, but you worry more now. Things seem to be a little bit worse, perhaps. But she's all right, and she's sensible. Victoria's very sound, basically. This is the Burger King car park. This is where everybody comes down on the night. They've all got to hear about Burger King. It's sort of like created its own legend. Practically everybody who's anybody comes down here. It's like you get a, a buzz, it's like a high from just coming down here and meeting folk and just driving about. And the reactions that you get from being in your car, it's brilliant. I don't really flog my car. I'm a girl racer who doesn't race. I uh, talk to all the people I know down here. I just drive past them and wave or flash or peep the horn. But I always come down here. I can't really avoid it. I can't keep away from the place. When I'm young and I'm stupid, I'm going to be coming down here and having a laugh and having fun because I'm going to be old for a very long time. I could be run over by a bus tomorrow. I want to live tonight. Well, I would like to think that Victoria in 10 years' time would be a very different person, a progression of uh, perhaps maybe one day she'll be married, children. Yeah, married a children. A career. Some beat up old estate car. Yes. Our priorities will change totally. And she won't be cruising? It'll pass. Oh, yes, as well.
Beetle was delivered to the pub where I was working and I'd about an hour left and I was like really waiting for the time to go by really quickly because I was really looking forward to driving my car. Eventually I got out and I took it for a drive around Bradford and it was just one of the most amazing days of my life. There was everybody looking at it. I had a really, really good time just driving around with the stereo on full blast. It was a really nice day so I wound the roof back up there. It was just totally, totally brilliant. You know, the car was absolutely perfect, it was shining. The engine was in tip-top condition, everything was just perfect. All through my life I've looked at other people's Beatles and really been envious of them. And eventually it was my turn to get one of my own. Now I know the car looks brilliant to look at, but underneath it's absolutely rotten. In fact the only thing that works in it now is the clock. I thought when Chris said he, he, he wanted a car that he should buy something like a Maestro because the, it would have been cheaper than the, the car he bought for the, for the same year. The parts would have been a lot cheaper and I think it would have kept its value better as well. Dad's a totally different person to me. He does everything different to me. For instance, he's a teacher, he votes Labour, and he stays in at night and watches documentaries. I vote Conservative. I like to go out to the pub and have a good time. But most of all, I'd never, ever drive a Volvo Estate. Because for me, it's the worst sort of car you could drive. So dependable, so boring. And I hope I never, ever own one. I was driving down Great Orton Road, which is about a mile away from here, and suddenly I just fell back in my seat. And what had happened was the seat had actually fallen through the um, floor of the car, and the car was like in a real mess. I saw that the floor had been made out of um, molten fiberglass and just been spread on the floor. There was no metal there at all, so the car was in a real state. So I got the car repaired. It cost a couple of hundred pounds, which Again, didn't seem that much, because I've got such a bargain when I bought the car. But then a couple of months later, I was all ready to take the car to the Glastonbury Festival. This was last June. I was really, really looking forward to it. And they just took it down to the garage, because there'd been a few more knocking noises. They looked underneath, and they, they were just laughing, because the car was just knackered. Absolutely knackered. The front end had just collapsed, and it was, like, undrivable. It would have been dangerous to take it outside Bradford, let alone 250 miles down to Glastonbury. So I was just devastated, it totally put a downer on my life. I lent Chris about £1,500 to buy the car, and he still owes me about £800. He started off paying it off very well, um, until he lost his job in the summer holidays, and since then we haven't had anything at all. My dad never stopped nagging me about the car. Just totally car, car, car all the time. And it wouldn't go. It would go, but it just banged, banged, banged. And things just got worse, you know. I mean, if I had somewhere else to live, I would have moved out of the house. Things got that bad. But he made me do all stupid menial tasks around the house and things. Last summer, he made me build a wall in the garden. I'd never built a wall before. And I don't know how he expected me to do it, but he just paid me something really ridiculous. It took about four days to do it. God knows what I was doing. And they made me paint the garage and really stupid tasks like digging the garden and stuff, you know, really degrading for about two pounds an hour. Real downer, totally. Everyone in our family is really different. My mum and myself are not very sporty at all. I mean, I personally can't stick spot. I only do it to stop me getting a beer belly. Our brother's quite a top table tennis player. He's about, I don't know, number 10 in the country, maybe. 
So my, obviously my dad's really, really proud of his achievements. But I think I've achieved quite a lot too. I've started up as a DJ and I'm, you know, I'm doing all right up in the North East. I'm earning some money and I'm having a really good time. My dad doesn't seem to be really bothered about what I'm doing. He never buys me any, any equipment like CDs and stuff. But my brother gets bought stuff like um, table tennis bats and tracksuits and things all the time. And they cost hundreds of pounds and it really cheeses me off that I get nothing while my brother gets everything. I wish they'd just like write off the debt or something, you know. Because I mean, 750 pounds, all right, it's a fair amount of money, but I mean, it's the sort of debt that they could afford to write off. I mean, it's only like five tracksuits and two table tennis bats. I think the main effect it's had is that we can't really talk about it anymore. Because as soon as I mention his, his episode with the car, then he just blows up and shouts at me, and um, that's the end of it, really, unless we want to go on shouting. It must be a real downer for my mum and dad, because they're, like, leaving the house every morning to see the car and they're grumbling about it. And evidently, people have been saying to my mum that the car's cheesing them off outside the house. I mean, they can all piss off for all I can, I'm not really bothered, you know? It's their tough shit. I don't think I'll ever regret not buying a Maestro, because they're just the most boring cars in the world. If I'd bought one, I'd still have it on the road now, fair enough, but I wouldn't have had the good times with my Beetle. I look back on my Beetle as part of my life that went wrong but while it did last it was really good and I'll never forget that first car I drove on my own was on the day I passed my driving test on this very road. I went to pick up my brother Oliver from school um, and I was so nervous when I was driving along. I was looking in my mirror all the time and checking everything, holding onto the steering wheel like it was a life support machine. And um, when I got there, Oliver wasn't at all happy to see me. In fact, he didn't talk to me all the way home because I could drive and he couldn't and he was really miffed. <laughs> My brother Oliver and I used to have the most almighty rows about Mum's Metro because he decided that he needed to drive it all the time and I needed to drive it all the time and Daddy got a bit fed up of it. And at the same time, a friend of mine was moving and needed to sell her car and get something more grown up. So my father bought him for me. I know very little about cars. I know that the engine's in the front, and I know that it's called a bonnet, but I don't have a clue how to get it up. And I know that you put your shopping in the back. <laughs> and I don't know an awful lot else about them, really. 
What a pile of rubbish. And I said to him, it isn't rubbish. I love it. And he, he said, quite frankly, I would rather walk than go in this pile of crap. So I said to him, well, the only thing that's wrong with the car is that it's French. ago I was driving back from Bedford one afternoon one Sunday afternoon and the car got slower and slower and slower and it wouldn't go up any hills and in the end I ground to a halt in Toddington service station called the AA told them I was a woman on my own told them exactly what was wrong with it and they um, they came out and it turned out that I had not actually put any oil in the car this is a bit of a problem and the whole of the inside had scrunkled up so, Daddy had to know about this, obviously, because it cost £97 to get it mended, or £99 or something. And he, um, he wasn't that happy. As he'd already taught me to put oil in it. He, he just stood over the top of me, and every time I tried to make up a good excuse, he, sat, he stood there and went, shh. Not a happy bunny. I think Brian is a car which suits me completely. Sort of a bit scatty, funny looking. He's not grown up at all. Um, and I'm not grown up at all. I'm not bothered about becoming grown up. I don't think I could cope with the responsibility. myself driving a great big Land Rover or Range Rover with oodles of children and dogs in the back and um, I imagine that I no I hope that I'll be married to Chris <laughs> but at the moment he can't commit himself to a night out never mind marrying me so we'll have to see The first car I bought was actually a blue Ford Fiesta, which was an E-Reg car. Um, I paid two and a half thousand pounds and I bought it from a local garage in Pudsey. Now, me and my friends, there was five of the friends, I was the first out of them to actually get a car and to pass a driving test. It was a fairly basic car, it wasn't outrageous, but it was in really good condition, it had a really good stereo and it went well. Um, and it made my life a lot easier. And at first I think my friends maybe were envious, but it soon came to their advantage and they got their uses, as did I.
on our street it used to be a play area where children were safe to kind of play there used to be benches trees flowers but i mean now it's just like a rubble kind of dead end road To be honest, without a car you are very limited because there's not a lot of things really you can do in army. So I mean to have a car really does take the boredom out of being young. Neither my mum or dad can drive. Um, so really making the fact that I could drive and I had the car made it a lot more easier for them. Um, for convenience. I mean, I'd take my mum shopping on a Thursday to Morrison's, pick her up from Bingo on a Friday, um, and it was like a taxi service. And when we had our family holiday that year, we went to Great Yarmouth, and we was able, you know, to go in the car, which was good for me, because it was experience, and that was 230 miles. So it was really convenient for them, really, to have the car, and they did feel proud. And, I mean, they benefited from it. One Wednesday morning when I was running extremely late for work, I was just in so much of a hurry to get to work. I just automatically got my hairbrush, got my spot cream and got into the car and I just really wanted to get to work as quick as I can. Now at that time I actually had a Jason Donovan kind of hairstyle which was an absolute nightmare to kind of set and comb and everything. And I was in the car, I was trying to do my hair, put my spot cream on and just look presentable for work when all of a sudden I realised I'd just gone straight into the back of a lorry, which, I mean, it was just so, so much of a nightmare. And I'd gone under the lorry, and I stayed in the car for about five minutes, and then I got out and I assessed the damage, and I just couldn't believe it because the all of the front car had come up and it was just a complete write-off. And it was just such a nightmare that I'd lost the car, basically. At the time, I was working in a travel agency and I was earning a wage of 5,500. 5, now, I got the loan from the bank for two and a half thousand pounds and after crashing the car, I half expected I wouldn't have to pay it back. So I went in to see them, explained I had only third party fire and theft insurance and kind of, you know, said to them what can be done and they kind of said, well, I'm sorry, it's kind of tough. You've crashed your car and you've lost your money and you'll still be expected to repay the money. And for the last two and a half years, I've been repaying £75 a month. A few months ago now, I bought this Metro. I paid £250 from my best friend's dad. Now, the Metro has done nothing really for me. I bought it in desperation because I was so desperate, you know, just to get a car and to be back on the road. But since having it, I mean, my friends now have all developed and they've all got nice cars. And I mean, they're just so embarrassed to come into this car because of the kind of old age pensioner image it has. So, I mean, obviously, when we go out there, just say, you know, your cars are no go. And, I mean, in general, putting everything together, it's just an embarrassing car for me to have to drive. If I wasn't repaying my £75 a month back to the bank for the loan, there's lots of things really I'd like to buy. I'd buy new clothes and try to, you know, be with the fashion, new LPs, new music. And at the moment, I'm actually into theme parks. Um, me and my friend go to quite a lot of the theme parks because there's quite a lot within, like, a 70-mile radius, and I'm really into them. And it's the type of thing where you go and you pay one fee and then all the rides are free all day. So, I mean, I'd take advantage of that more and do more on a weekend and see new things, do new things, as opposed, you know, to be restricted because you just haven't got the money.
in 10 years time I'm really hoping to have developed in my career. Now at the moment I'm working as a telephone sales advisor for the Motormark magazine and I've just recently been given um, a position in the special projects department which is interesting. Now all the um, cars the Motormark have are Vauxhalls and hopefully in 10 years I'll have progressed to be the commercial manager of the Motormark and she's actually got the latest model Cavalier SRI which are really really good and they've got kind of every possible refinement so that's definitely what I'm aiming towards getting and I'm looking forward to the years ahead. When you're teenagers especially if you live with your parents it's brilliant having a car, it's essential because then it's like you've got your own flat you've got the radio and you've got heat and you can get all your friends and you can go anywhere We're just mad, we're just lethal We've got everything, we've got music, food and we've got laughter It's like a godsend you know, if I want to go down to the pub, I just get in my car and I go. I went to Birmingham the other day. No problem, jump in the car, shoot down to Birmingham. I actually managed to get my car because my parents said that if I didn't go to public school anymore and they didn't have to pay £3,000 a term, then they'd agreed to buy me, I quote, a cheap runaround. So I got my car that way. We were all in Switzerland driving over the Alps and James was five at the time and suddenly out of the blue he said when I'm grown up I want a Porsche and my husband said good gracious no I'd never buy you anything like a Porsche I should buy you something nice and safe like a Volvo and the sulky little boy said I don't want a Volvo I want a Porsche and my husband said well a Volvo's all you'll ever get out of me and for a couple of minutes there was silence and then he piped up and said I'll wait till you're dead and I'll sell the Volvo and buy a Porsche and we all thought outrageous little beast Unfortunately, things are now much more serious. The reason I got my car in the first place was basically, we've lived abroad all our lives, and my father always promised we'd move back to England when my grandfather died, which sure enough he did. So, you know, once he'd sort of popped his clogs, we, we had this house, um, which he did up for about a year, and he then decided he wanted to sell it because he got a rather encouraging offer. And as for a bribe, he offered my sister and I flats and cars. And sure enough, you know, we never saw the flats and we got fairly shafted on the cars. It was a pity, actually, because we really did desperately want a family home. My husband offered James an upgrade on his car for his 21st birthday. And James took upgrade to be something snazzier, something a bit faster, something sleeker, something more in tune with his image. And my husband had a complete different interpretation. He thought upgrade was something bigger, solider, safer. He kept saying more metal around you. And there was absolutely no meeting of minds at all. And they just bellowed at each other angrily for two months. The one stipulation my father actually had when, when he was saying what I could buy car-wise was that I was just not allowed a GTI, whatever happens, you know, regardless of car, as long as it's not a GTI. Because the only thing he understands about cars is that GTI means speed, which means death. So sure enough, I went out to Renault, my mother, and we discovered the Renault Clio 16V, which means 16 valve, which is, you know, the most lethal car ever. It's equivalent of a GT Turbo. And so sure enough, I went back and I said, look, Dad, you know, honestly, it's, it's a 16V, it's, it means you know, it's got better seat covers and electric windows and that sort of thing. And he was like, oh, fine, fine, okay, that sounds exactly right, you know, you crack on sort of thing. 
Sure enough, he bought it. He then came in and saw these three oil pressure gauges and went absolutely berserk, I mean, apoplectic, thinking, you know, because he'd seen those in Aston Martin. And it was, it was a horror. And when he hears this, I'm going to be in all sorts of trouble as well. My sister was extremely jealous of, of the 21st situation. She got a watch, a very, very fine watch. I got a car. And as a result, she feels extremely hard done by. She lives in Fulham and comes from this rather sort of Fulham bunch who are very, very nice. And I come from a Chelsea bunch, which is rather more smooth. My friends on the whole are staggeringly rich. I don't mean that sound obnoxious, but a lot of them have household names, whether they be chocolate manufacturers or not. And as a result, it's very difficult to compete. And I mean, there's no competition against BMWs and Mercedes, age 19, 20, whatever. But at the same time, I did want to sort of, you know, keep my end up slightly and try not to let the side down. And yeah, this car seemed reasonable enough, really. This is the King's Road, which is my home turf. So stomping ground. I've been coming here since I was 13. Love it. Go to all the clubs, all the pubs. Everyone I know hangs out here or lives in Chelsea or Kensington, I suppose, but certainly this is where most people congregate. Sadly, I mean, the problem with the King's Road at the moment is that it's 11.30 in the morning. So all these people you see around here are just sort of weekend rabble who are coming shopping. I love the King's Road. I mean, I don't shop here, but this really is my stamping ground. Absolutely home away from home. My father and I have a rather strange relationship. I mean, there's some love, but basically love skips generation and it's mainly based on money. It's a sort of financial situation whereby we have a sort of deal rather than a particularly affectionate relationship. Well, this is something which he proudly tells me anyway, but it's difficult really. Um, as a result, we, we fight. I mean, he thinks I'm a wastrel and I think he's, you know, unnecessarily unpleasant. I'm going to get in so much trouble when you watch this, I really am. Being a car thief isn't saying that you go to college and learn. You don't get sitting gills in it. Basically, you just pick it up as you go along. Any car that was new that came out, you try it out and you get quicker and quicker at it. I mean, towards the end, of, they were bringing these Cavaliers out with deadlock systems and that, which are no good. And they were saying that they're impossible to break into. And in the end, I was getting into them within about six seconds. I don't feel as a mother that I went wrong in any way with Craig. Considering he was brought up without a dad, all three of them being brought up without a dad. So I don't blame me, and I don't really blame Craig. I'll blame the car. When I come home from work, I rush in, have a bath, get dressed, and I rush back out again. I don't even sit in and have dinner or watch telly. I'd just like to be able to get out of the house, get in my car and drive. I've always been attracted to cars from a really young age. I mean, even from being in my dad's car, he used to let me just steer the car into the garage 
before he was pulling up and parking. I, I used to get a real good kick out of that. I used to really enjoy it, just sitting on his lap and steering the car. When I was at school, I'd like to always be the one that had everything. Even until now, if my mate's got a Pioneer stereo, I want to get an Alpine. A friend of mine had, had a Mark I Escort. I had an XR2. Now I've sold me XR2. I've got a Renault 5 GT Turbo. I always like to be one up from everyone else. Sounds big headed, but it's just the way I like to be. This is what uh, basically we called the Mad Mile. Most car thieves, otherwise me, used to race down here as fast as we can. You know, I'd see how fast we can get out of any of the cars that we had. It's otherwise known as Sick Up Bypass. Used to race down here as quick as you can, see how fast you get before you get to the bottom turning. Just after the bottom bend, there's a bridge. We used to get about 120, 130 out of most cars down here. Uh, the road just basically claimed a lot of lives through people racing as fast as they can and losing control just on this bend that we're approaching here. Just as you come around this bend, we used to get between 80 and 100, basically. And you get a lot of kids that are and lose it, take the bend too tight, smack straight into that bridge there. When I had the crash in the Montego, it really scared me. It shook me right up. I didn't, didn't think I'd actually go back to driving for a little while, because I broke my leg in the crash. And it sort of gave me another a view of looking at things because I hurt someone else in a crash. And uh, that's really one of the main things that stopped me from nicking cars, really. It made me think twice because I, I hurt someone else and also I hurt myself. And that's when I actually thought to myself, this has got to stop. Ever since I've gone on the straight and narrow, I've had nothing but a hard time from everybody because they say a leopard never changes its spots. But I think I'm just one of those strange leopards. I think in 10 years time, Craig will be driving a, a bigger and a better car and he'd be living in a penthouse. He'd like to live in a penthouse. This is what he's always telling me. Mother, when I get old enough, or when I've got enough money, he said, I'm going to be living in a penthouse. It's all good. I'll come and visit you. You can give me some tea. When I got in the car, a lot of my friends basically told me that um, you've got to be careful, all the guys are going to want you for your car and not for you. But I don't think that would be true. My Beetle is a bonus in attracting the boys. They all want to know me more and give me more attention. The roof came off the house when I told my parents I was buying an XR2. They thought I was going to kill myself. I was too young to realise the dangers. And my parents went mad. My parents are very worried about me being alone in the car. They usually give me a time that I have to be home by in the evenings. And a few minutes after that is the time that I know that they're going to call the police.
the car was bought because she'd done ever so well in her A-level results. And secondly, I thought it will give her a good deal of independence when she's at college. Why I went along with James was because she, she'd chosen to go to a Scottish university, Edinburgh. And she, she was an asthma, she is still an asthma sufferer. And you can put a coat on, Victoria, but she doesn't always remember to, to button it up. But she's got to close the car door. Buying me the car was a little bit like wrapping me up in cotton wool when they had to let go of me, when they had to send me off to university. And it's like their protective shell around me still. I suppose it's their way of giving me a license to freedom. In the Woody Allen film, Play Against Sam, he places things around his flat to impress a girl and I do the same thing in my car, not to impress anyone, but I think just to create an image that I'm into the things I'm into. There's a map of France in the, the side pocket because well, I haven't ever been there in my car, but I'm going there one day. makes me feel much more grown up and in control and free and stuff and I can do what I want when I want. I can go off places at the drop of a hat and don't have to tell anyone and that's just great and, and also it makes me feel kind of mature in a secure way like going to the going to the supermarket. I absolutely love going to the supermarket and loading up the back with the shopping bags. I like that. I'll get over it. I know I will when I have to do it enough times, but at the moment it feels, it feels dead mature. Before I had the car, I had the most beautiful old framed bicycle. I still got it, but it's a really touchy emotional subject because the cars replaced the bike and like, it's, I just think all the time, what, car, bike, car, bike, what am I going to take? And it's always car. I had an accident coming back from Edinburgh last term, and it felt as if I was betraying my parents' trust in me. I was, um... When I, when I hit what I hit, it was like ramming mum and dad. And... You know, I wanted them to be angry with me, but, you know, to shout at me and say, how could you do this? We gave you this beautiful car and you, and you screw it up. But they weren't, they were great. They were just, as long as I was okay, that's all they were worried about, which I expect is how anyone would really react. But I wanted them to be angry because I was so angry at myself. My parents and me are really close. In fact, I'd say almost too close. Our apron strings are tied way too tight. I thought that saying goodbye for the first time, going off to university, would make every subsequent time easier, but it's really just made it harder.
The day I passed my driving test was the happiest day of my life. Oh, what a rush. I knew I'd passed, mind, I just knew I would do it. And when I did, I thought, that's it. <laughs> I'm off. We'll be back behind the wheel for more tales of modern motoring next week. She likes it hot at the same time, 9.30, next Friday on BBC Two. And this new...
Thank you. 
Christmas. On to and a performance in the park. If you to be my bodyguard, well, I could be a long, long time. I could tell you, Betty, Betty, when you call me, you can call me out. Call him Paul Simon in Central Park, Boxing Day at 9.45 on BBC Two. And music is still very much to the fore now in our documentary film shown for the first time on network television of the Talking Heads concert in Hollywood, Stop Making Sense. New Year's Eve on BBC Two and the cult thriller Mad Max. Look any longer out on that road and I'm one of them. A terminal crazy. Mel Gibson is Mad Max, New Year's Eve at 5 past 10 on BBC Two. Well, that's one vision of the future, and here with another, although hopefully not so alarming, is John Ketley and Weatherview. Hello again. Well, there's been some pretty alarming weather across the country on Monday, I must say. Some very heavy rain over southern Scotland, northwest England earlier on today. Something like 14 to 29 millimetres, generally speaking. Some torrential rain adding to all the rain that's been up there in the last few days and melting snow as well. Across in the Isle of Man too at Douglas, something like 80 millimetres of rain fell there first thing this morning. Well, that was the band of rain around about 6 o'clock and it's been making progress southwards as the day has gone along. It's been a cold front which has been connected to that rain. Much, much colder weather coming in behind. Temperatures of 12, 13, 14 ahead of it. But that cold front did make fairly steady progress during Monday right across the country, clearing southeastern parts of England around about the middle part of the afternoon. Some very strong gusts around it as well, squally gusts, up to 80-odd miles an hour down in South Wales across into Dorset, and interestingly a gust of 91 miles an hour up at Sunborough in Shetland. Now, I said it was pretty mild ahead of that cold front. It certainly was, and that's the league table to prove it. Temperatures 11 to 14, generally speaking. But as you can see here up in the north, behind the cold front, temperatures only 5 or 6 degrees at best throughout the day. Well, those are the strong winds at the moment. The gale force winds now pushing across Scotland and down through the North Sea. In fact, the winds are going to get much lighter during Tuesday before eventually they begin to freshen up again across there in Northern Ireland and the west of Scotland with some rain coming in there by Christmas Day. Well, tonight a fair number of showers still around, particularly over Scotland and Northern Ireland coming down through northwest England into the North Midlands and North Wales. And many of those showers are actually quite wintry as well, some sleet and snow, a bit of hail and thunder up in the north. So there could be some ice on the roads virtually anywhere where you've sheltered from that wind. But around the coast, temperatures staying 2 or 3 degrees above freezing, but certainly some uh, pretty low temperatures in sheltered parts of the glens of Scotland. Well, there's the high pressure on Christmas Eve then. Things quietening down quite a bit. The very strong winds moving away to the east. So we're going to find a fair amount of sunshine around on Christmas Eve. Many places enjoying uh, copious amounts of sunshine in actual fact. But the clouds will build up during the course of the day. Now, there will be these wintry showers again over Scotland down the western side of Wales. The odd one in Northern Ireland as well. But across in the west, I think it will tend to cloud over as the day goes along. Plenty of sunshine to come then, but temperature's not really uh, going up very much tomorrow. It's going to be a pretty cold day, despite that wind just easing down. I think about 6 to 8 degrees just about sums it up. The highest temperature's likely down here across southern England. Well, there's the chart for Christmas Day, and you can see another quite nasty area of low pressure just moving to the north of Scotland. The winds are never going to be particularly strong. They'll be quite strong and gusty, but not the sort of strength of wind that we saw on Monday. So on Christmas Day then, certainly the best of the weather down in the south, although it will be quite a cold start, quite a frosty start in many parts of England and Wales, but then a reasonable amount of sunshine to come 
Now, further north over Northern Ireland and Scotland, you'll find this milder weather coming in, quite breezy weather too, and there'll be outbreaks of rain spreading to most parts during the course of the day. It's just possible that thicker cloud and patchy rain may move a little bit further south into Northern England and North Wales as the day goes along, but I think most of the rain will be confined to the north. Well, that's it from me then. May I wish you a very good night's sleep. Christmas Eve on BBC Two. The wolves are running as two children battle with a scheming governess. You are going on a journey. Where to? You'll find out. Architectural splendor combines with festive carols in the annual concert from King's College Chapel. Rejoice in Maureen Lipman's affectionate portrayal of Joyce Grenfell. Oh, Lavinia, Lavinia. What do we do when we come back from the littlest room? We pull our knickers up again. It's always a joy to welcome Peter Cook and Woody Allen on a show like Have I Got News For You, which is why it's a bit of a shame that our guests are, in fact, Clive Anderson and Harry Enfield. <laughs> and the film that created Brigitte Bardot. Ah! An all-embracing Christmas Eve on BBC Two. Well, of course, it's not long to wait now until our Christmas Eve viewing. And although we're turning off the fairy lights here on two, BBC Radio will ease you gently into the daylight hours with Bob Harris on Radio 1 and Bill Reynolds on a night ride on Radio 2. For now, though, on behalf of everyone here at Television Centre, this is Jane Westrop wishing you a very good night. For a really refreshing change, forget the wet and get into the dry. Refreshing the dry, Blackthorn Cider. Live on Central, the big fight, Titan versus Sphinx. Watch it live on Monday. Catch the highlights on Tuesday. Details in TV Times. And that Tyson Sphinx fight is at 3.25 on Monday night. Now, the man from Uncle. It's all right. It's uh, only Nobia Zari. Do you read Russian? How exciting! Finding the right pension on your own can be a bit daunting. It can bog you down with paper, have you going round and round in circles. It can all be very painful. At Legal in General, we're experts at finding just the right pension for you. One you can take from one job to the next. Give us a ring or ask your financial advisor. Oh! Good morning, Mr. Mansell, sir. No doubt.